All right, everyone, I want to welcome you all back to some more short stories. Most importantly, guys, thank you again for all the love and support you continue to show this series. You guys have been making magic happen, so thank you. Like, ever since the start of this series, and then into Wick Room for Innocence, and now this. So, we're eventually going to move on to uh, Reincarnation soon enough. And, but yeah, we're going to enjoy these short stories first. I consider them intermissions, but they're very like intriguing intermissions at that. And yeah, we're like a few stories away from finishing. So if anything else, I hope you all continue to enjoy. Let's keep it going. All right, guys, welcome back. We are now continuing on with the story called A Slice of Sweet Serenity of Days Long Lost, Part 1. The Midsummer Festival was behind us, leaving only the hellish heat and none of the distractions. I'd lived here in the slums long enough to not be surprised by the chaos that came with the season, but I never looked forward to it either, particularly the smells. Mostly human smells. The alleys were where the worst of it was, and there was no peace of our little peacekeepers group when it came to decide who had, a, who had to patrol them. But even down here in the foulest dregs of the city, there were small pockets of light. Hidden spots where one could enjoy the breeze without worrying about catching a surprise whiff of rotting flesh. One such oasis was a small graveyard, home to those forgotten souls who passed with no family or loved ones. It looked like a little more than a scattered rocks in the grass if you didn't know any better. And for the past two and a half years, it had been tended to by a single young girl by the name of Morgana. Today, as I had almost every day since she'd come here, I headed for the graveyard. I've been having trouble focusing late recently. Ever since coming face to face with my feelings for her, I made rookie mistakes in training, which invited all sorts of teasing from Gratian. Give me a break, kid. You're even worse off than the day we met. I wanted nothing more than to clock him squaring the jaw, but I knew he was right. I wasn't myself. And of all things, it was love that was throwing me off. I could hardly believe it. Though, in reality, it was less the love itself and more the age difference that vexed me. Morgana was 11 years old, still a child and I was 21, an adult. Clearly, I was out of my mind. Something was wrong with me. I tried to talk myself out of it again and again, but the more energy I expended on the issue, the stronger the feelings became. If we were closer in age, it wouldn't have been such an issue, so why? I had no answer. Only these feelings. And at that point, I had no choice but to accept them. I was in love with her, with a child barely half my age, no matter how mature she acted, and there was nothing I could do to change that. I knew at least I would have to wait until she was older to tell her how I felt. I could only imagine how terrifying it would be for her to have to have a man twice her size and age profess his love. It was out of the question. I needed to make sure she didn't feel like I was pressuring her into anything, because that wasn't what I wanted. Ugh, why does everything have to be so difficult? The closer I got to the graveyard, the more of a disaster I felt. Obviously, I was thrilled to be able to be with Morgana. That wasn't even a question, but my own priorities were quickly shifting from keeping the peace in the slums to caring for her. Thoughts of her had begun to consume my life, though I would never admit as much to her. It was the awareness that posed the biggest challenge. It changed how I looked at her, threw out everything I knew about how to act around her. And Morgana had clearly caught on to my recent uneasiness as well. The other day, after a particularly awkward conversation, she had given me this burning glare and said, you seem on edge. What foolishness are you scheming now? What are you fretting over, Jacopo? Just act normal. It's not that hard. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Clear your head. I passed by a few makeshift gravestones searching for that distinctive tattered black robe. It usually wasn't hard to find with it mostly being grass and rocks here, but I had no such luck today. Is she not here yet? Deciding to wait for a bit, I headed over toward a tree for some shade, which is where I found Morgana, her head resting against the trunk. If you're going to sleep on the job, at least go back to the brothel and do it there, I mumbled under my breath approaching the tree. Hey. No response. Morgana. But once I got close enough, it became clear I hadn't just stumbled on her slacking off. She wasn't so much leaning against the tree. Morgana! As she was collapsed in front of it. I scrambled over to her, dropped to my knees and put a hand on her shoulder causing her to topple forward, her head falling into my chest. She was burning up. Hey, stay with me. Uh, 
Oh, it's you. Her golden eyes glanced up toward me, empty and slightly bloodshot. She clenched her lips together, as if trying to hold back a cough. I just have a bit of a fever, a little sleep, and I'll be fine. Like hell you will. We need to get you back to the brothel. No, I can't go back. Come again? No, I don't have time to deal with your stupid morals right now. I don't want to get anyone sick. They're doing their best. So she hadn't come out here for herself but to protect the girls at the brothel. And you call me stupid. Not a single person there cared about themselves over Morgana's safety. Not the girls and certainly not me. But she continued to insist I not bring her back. I bit my tongue, fighting back an urge to snap at her. I wanted to say something nice or reassuring, but I was too irritated by her usual self-sacrificing nonsense that I couldn't. So, I can take you somewhere else then, as long as it's not the brothel. I lifted her into my arms without permission, but it was an emergency. She would understand. Although, in her fever state, she didn't seem to understand much of anything right now. With Morgana in my arms, I hurried home. I laid her down in my bed, soaked an old rag in cold water and placed it across her forehead. It was all I had, but it was better than nothing. I'll be right back, I said, and then ran out the door. Next, I went to a pub, where I had the barmaid get me some fruit and other light foods. And while I was there, <clears throat> excuse me guys, I told a few of my peacekeeper companions about what was happening, asking them to cover for me that afternoon. They laughed and teased, but all I was concerned about right now was getting Morgana better. Next, I made my way to the brothel. Maria was still asleep, so I woke her up and explained what was going on. Thankfully, having known each other our whole lives, it only took a couple of minutes to get everything through her half-asleep head. She let out an exaggerated sigh and said, God, that girl. She should know us better than that by now. On my way out, Maria gave me a few pieces of advice and set up fresh sleepwear. With the clothes in hand, I rushed back home once more, the merciless summer sun pounding down on my sweaty back the entire time. When I made it back, Morgana's breathing was fast and shallow, her eyes clenched shut in pain. The rag on her forehead was already warm. I peeled it off and she opened her eyes apparently awake. Can you eat anything? She shook her head weakly. Then at least drink some water. If you don't have something, you're going to sweat it all out and wither away and die. Not that there's much in the tiny body of yours to lose in the first place. I felt a pointed stare but that was it. Nobody retorts. You know what's funny? Uh, I'm just noticing it now but... Or maybe it's because it's the shading... But Morgana doesn't have the the marks on her face right now. It's, it's pretty clear. It didn't look like she even had the energy to drink on her own. So I scooped some water into a cup and brought it to her lips. It took her a while to drink even half the small cup. Now you need some rest. But only after you get out of that robe. It's drenched. Maria gave me some nightwear for you to use. You'll be much cooler in this. I held out the immaculate white gown for her to see. Clothes in the slums were always someone's hand-me-downs, usually several times over. Something this new was a rarity. I'm fine just as I am, she said, turning her head away. Absolutely not, I snapped back. Just put this on, okay? Oh, I see. You're not comfortable changing with me in the room. Alright, I'll be outside. Does that work? Oh, come on. Say something. If you won't change yourself, I'll do it for you. You want me to rip that big heavy thing off you myself? Do you? You would, please. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You'll do it. You, what? Did did she just ask me to do it for her? I want out of this, but I can barely move myself. Uh, oh, r right. Yeah. All right. Fine. Well, since you asked so politely, my entire body suddenly froze up. I only said what I did because I was so certain she would tell me no. This was not part of the plan. The fever must have really gone to her. Under any other circumstances, she would never agree to this. Morgana hated showing people her skin, which was one reason she wore that heavy black robe even in the summer and kept her face hidden by that ridiculous hood. Keep your head, Jacopo. You're caring for a sick girl, nothing more. She's a child anyway. You're not so far lost that you would have inappropriate thoughts about a child, are you? Repeating the words in my head like a mantra, I began removing the robe. It was even whiter than it looked and weighed a ton. Her hair was sticking to the back of her neck too. I would probably need to comb that out when I was done. My heart pounding at probably dangerous speeds, I set the robe on the floor beside the bed, doing everything in my power to look anywhere other than at her. 
I then pulled the gown down over her head, guiding her arms to the sleeves. But as hard as I tried, I couldn't completely avoid the sight of her pale white skin, particularly her chest. But not for any uncouth reasons. It was the cross-shaped scar there that caught my eye. Scars covered Morgana's body from her time in Lord Barnier's captivity, and while the wounds themselves had healed, it was still a grisly sight. The deepest among them was a cross-shaped scar in the center of her chest, which seemed to embody the entire tragic story of her life. Seeing it filled me with unspeakable sadness and helplessness. Not to mention deep shame at the base thoughts that had threatened to cross my mind in the moments before. I wish there was something, anything I could do to show her that not everyone was out to hurt her, as much as the world may have made it seem so. I'm... Yanked back to my senses by the sound of her voice, I pulled the gown down the rest of the way in a panic. I was just making sure I got on right. Absolutely nothing inappropriate, I swear, I said. That was perhaps the least convincing excuse imaginable. She looked me straight in the eye, then turned away. And then, in a voice as soft as a feather, she whispered, I'm sorry. You're sorry? For what? I don't understand you at all. Maybe she felt ba bad about imposing on me. Either way, she sure got meek when she was feeling well, huh? She wasn't feeling well, huh? I chuckled to myself. The only thing you need to concern yourself with right now is getting better. Then, when you are, you can tell me to go burn in hell for this like the Morgana I know would. Don't apologize. Okay. See? This is what I'm talking about. I can't deal with you like this. I said with a sigh, picking the robe up off the floor and making my way toward the window. If I set it out in the sun, it'd probably be wearable again by tomorrow. Is there anything else you want from me? Believe it or not, I'm capable of showing kindness when someone's sick. So ask away. I'm at your service. Yeah, I figured as much. Me. Hmm? Leave me. Ah, right. You want time to rest in peace, I, I under. Don't leave me. I stopped dead in my tracks and spun back to look at her. Had she really asked me not to leave her alone? Her? Morgana? I was pretty sure I hadn't misheard her at least. Sh sure, I said uncertainly then headed back towards the bed at taking a seat on the edge. The wooden frame creaked under the weight of a second body. Your... What? Your face... is red. Did I get you sick? No, of course not. I'm perfectly fine. That's good. Morgana's eyes were unfocused like she was drifting between dream and reality. I doubted she grasped what was going on or anything she had said. And by the time tomorrow came around, she would probably have forgotten everything. Which was probably for the best. I didn't want her to remember me looking like this. He reached over and took Morgana's hand in mine. She didn't protest and in fact it seemed to help her relax. Because less than a minute later, she had drifted quietly off to sleep. The sight of her soft sleeping face in the sunlight was indescribably beautiful. No matter how hideous anyone else may have thought it. I remained there, her hand in mine, for a while longer. And as I said a little prayer. May I be the one to take these hands and guide them into the future. Okay, that was a nice story. Like, I didn't know that after the the summer festival that she got sick and he ended up taking care of her. So this is like one of the things about these short stories that I do enjoy. They give you like more insights to like what went on during the main story of, or should I say the main storyline and then the storyline of what went on during um, A Wet Room for Innocence. Okay, so we're going to do part two now. Felt like nightmare after nightmare, dreams of my mother abandoning me, of nobles mocking me, of that terrible lord drinking my blood, of filthy men in the slums gagging at the sight of me. But no matter how many times they threatened to swallow me up, there was always a hand there holding me in place. It was a man's hand, large and strong, but soft and gentle. It could only belong to one person. Eh. I slowly drifted back to reality. My head still hurt a little, but it wasn't as hard to breathe anymore and I could clearly see again. Pale blue moonlight seeped into the room through the window. I pushed myself up in the bed, a little too hard though. 
The weight I was used to being there was gone, causing me to misjudge the push and stumble. I looked down to find myself in a white robe I didn't recognize. It was light and breezy, and it felt nice on my skin. Lifting my arms up, the fabric made a pleasant rustling sound. My hair had also been let down, the braids undone and all of it brushed. I gripped my right hand shut, then loosened it again, repeating the action several times. It felt slightly warmer than the left, as if someone had been holding it while I slept. Looking around, I realized where I was. It's his home. I had been here about a month earlier around the time of the Midsummer Festival, and the ceiling above me looked exactly the same as it did back then. Compared to almost to the almost sickly sweet aroma of all the women in the brothel, it smelled almost earthly and rugged here. That alone was enough to tell it was a man's home. What I didn't know, though, was why I was here. I'd woken up this morning feeling unwell, so I went to the graveyard to rest by the tree, but I couldn't remember anything after that. Oh, you're up. How are you feeling? There was another presence in the moonlit room. As it drew closer, its silhouette grew clearer. In the past, I would have braced myself at the sight of a man, no matter who, approaching me in the dark, but I was able to stay relatively calm now. The moon shining through the solitary window was the only source of light. Candles were a luxury most couldn't afford in the slums. And in the pale light, I could see his face twisted into a frown. Not an angry frown. One of concern. I'd learned to tell the two apart in the two and a half years since we'd met. Though I would never admit it. Gazing absently at him, a number of questions leapt to mind. Had he brought me here? Had he watched over me the whole night? Had he been the one holding my hand? Would you care to explain what I'm doing here? But the question that actually made it out surprised even me with how callous it sounded. Hey, you need to learn to show some goddamn gratitude. You're here because you decided to drag your dumb sick ass to the graveyard and pass it out and pass out there of some stupid misguided attempt to protect the girls at the brothel. I brought you to my place so you didn't die out there in the heat. Let me give you a hint. Two words rhymes with thank you. <laughs> I never asked for your help. You couldn't be any more impossible if you tried. What happened to the girl from this afternoon? What? N nothing. Don't worry about it. I tilted my head in confusion. He clenched his lips and averted his gaze. I hoped I hadn't said or done anything in the few hours I'd lost. A mix of worry and humiliation grappled inside me, pulling me back and forth between wanting to ask and not wanting to know anything. Anyway. But before I could make a decision for myself, he changed the subject. At least you've recovered enough to put that sharp tongue of yours back into action, he said with a smirk. I had no idea what to say. Clearly he had looked after me when I was unable to look after myself. For that, he deserved thanks, but I couldn't actually put that into words. And even worse, I was afraid of whatever I said next would only upset him more. You haven't eaten anything all day. You must be starving. I am not. Before I could finish the sentence, though, my stomach allowed a deep rumble. My eyes went wide, and I gave him a desperate look, then dropped my gaze to my hands. I couldn't believe that had happened, my stomach growling in hunger like an ordinary girl. It was humiliating. I stared down in my clenched fist for what felt like an eternity, unable to bring myself to look up at him. When I heard a muffled snicker from above, I wanted to snap at him for laughing at me, but I couldn't even manage that. Come here. He grabbed the chair and placed it by the window. I knew it was only because that was the one source of light in the room, but still I was hesitant to step out of the darkness without a hood to cover my face. I could see so much more of the world than usual. Standing in the moonlight, he was illuminated from head to toe, and I could even make out the details in his face. He was smiling gently, not smirking or glaring or frowning as I had expected. His eyes, the color of fallen leaves, narrowed just slightly. What's gotten into you? There was always a hint of derision in his smile. There was always a trace of contempt in his words. He was short-tempered and quick to shout. He was obsessed with logic and always complaining about feelings. So why was he being so... none of that now? You're the worst. He hadn't, done the, he hadn't done a thing wrong, and yet everything felt wrong. It wasn't playing fair for him only to be nice to me now. It was cowardly for him to only smile at me like that now. A kind of irritation I didn't know how to describe began pooling within me. Nothing was making sense anymore, and I didn't know who I could ask to explain it either. So it just built up and up and up, to the point that it was almost hard to breathe, to the point that I almost felt sick. As unflattering as it was to describe my own feelings that way, but it scared me, not knowing what any of it was. Would I ever have an answer? Would I ever have a name for this feeling? Would the day ever come that I could feel comfort in it? And would I even be me if it did? I certainly couldn't imagine myself there ever. With that kind of confidence, 
smiling like him, being sociable like Maria or Jaren. Are you just going to sit there and stare off into space? Whatever. I always had my hood up and my head turned down, so I almost never had the chance to look at him so unobstructed, which reminded me how much older than me he was. He was an adult, and I was just a kid. He didn't have to look after me either, but he did, for whatever reason. And who knew how long that would even last? He could very well go off and do something else with his life, somewhere far away, before I figured anything out. So, um, I said. The thoughts just kept coming and coming, almost sending me into a panic. He frowned slightly, tilting his head. And every second I couldn't figure out what to say next, his frown deepened. But his patience never ran out. He stood there and waited. Which reminded me, once not long after we first met, when I still considered him a potential threat, he'd done the same thing. He waited for me to speak, despite not being a patient man at all. In four years... What? In four years, how old will you be? What, can't you do the math yourself? Anyway, I'll be 26, four years from now. 26. Hearing the number point to perspective exactly how far ahead of me he was... By then, he could have a loving wife and children. And why wouldn't he? That was what people did at that phase of their lives. What? What will you be doing then? Hell if I know. What kind of question is that? I mean, I at least like to be done scraping by every day of my life by then. Another four years of this is more than I can take. Oh. What's gone into you? He said with a sigh. I turned up to face him. Words danced on the tip of my tongue. If you could just wait for, no, one year. If you could just stay here, in this confined life he hated so much, not trying to go out into the world like he loved to talk about. One year was all I needed. That would be enough time to make sense of myself, to convince myself I was a regular girl like anyone else, and to figure out what on earth I actually felt about him. I knew I would just be holding him back. Why should he care about accommodating the wishes of a hideous girl like me? But if you could just wait a year, just one year, Morgana... All I had to do was say it, and it would take a huge weight off my shoulders, but I couldn't bring myself to put those thoughts into words. Not because I didn't want to, or because I was too embarrassed to, but because the act of asking for something still held so much weight for me. Are you still feeling under the weather? Is that it? Perhaps so. Damn. Then you'll want something light, I'm guessing. I got some fruit from the barmaid at the pub. He stepped over toward me, holding out his hand. It was large and bony, nothing like my own hand. And in it, he held an apple, which I accepted with both hands. He managed to get me new clothes and food, which I knew wasn't easy given our circumstances. And as much as he yelled about me thanking him, he never once tried to guilt me about everything he'd done for me. Not him, nor the girls at the brothel. Don't get too generous, I said, carrying the apple to my mouth. I have no way of paying you back. My help isn't an investment I'm looking for returns on. You know that perfectly well. Or are you starting to feel guilty? That's cute, he said with a chuckle. Instead of applying, I bent to the apple. Its sweet juices filled my mouth. If you want to pay me back, just remember to say something nice over my grave. I know you've got a soft spot for the dead. Sure. I giggled, holding the apple in front of my mouth so he couldn't see it. Apparently, he still remembered the time I told him, if you want me to be nice to you, go die. <laughs> ah, that's a lot of work. But the truth was, I wanted to do something for him in life. In return, since even before then. And I hope you live a long life. That way, I won't have to worry about showing you any kindness for many years. You're really against the idea of being nice to me, huh? He said, frowning. More than you could ever imagine. No mercy. But alright, fine. I'll live a long life. And so will you, and Maria, and Jaren, and that dumbass Gratian, and all our other friends. Right. I handed the half eaten apple back to him guessing he hadn't eaten for almost as long as me. And after a few moments of hesitation, he accepted it, taking a large bite out of the untouched side. I watched quietly. Some part of me certain that we would have many more occasions just like this, and the sweet taste of the apple still lingering in my mouth, I whispered, to a long life for all of us. All right, that was a really nice conclusion to the the sweet serenity, the sweet serenity of long of days long lost. I was gonna say of days long past. Either way, similar. Um, so yeah, guys, I'm gonna end the video for the day, and we're gonna continue on to the ghost of Rose Manor and the not so little mermaid. I decided to go 
in the order of just going straight down and then move upwards because it seems like that's the way to go. I, f I feel anyway. But anyways, guys, thank you again. And until the next one.